So when you think about the, the next unicorn uh, brand, I think for me, the ingredients of the cake are lots of different things, lots of little things that really make that cake rise. Yeah. OK. So we've known each other for a while. We have. And we've worked together closely during your time at Gymshark and now closely together in your post Gymshark world with For Now. Give me a, a feel for why you do what you do. Like, what's the motivation for this next stage? Yeah, no, uh, great question. Love helping people build stuff is probably where I'm at. Probably that with a combination of giving back. So when I was CEO for Gymshark, that seven year period was just phenomenal working with some, you know, an awesome team right across the organization. Um, there's one thing I didn't do well enough as CEO of Gymshark, which was um, personally give back. Um, really from a, a philanthropic perspective and especially with young people. So obviously we employed a lot of young people. We actually did work with a couple of organizations, but really didn't do it well enough, to be honest. So, um, you know, for now came about as sort of a, a, a sort of a dream actually came to me at three o'clock in the morning, one morning, which was how can I use the Gymshark experience in helping build a unicorn, as I said, with that awesome team, uh, but also give back at the same time. And really that, that light bulb moment came out of a train journey. I remember getting on the train, there was three young guys, 16, 17 year old guys. Um, and two of the three of the guys had their feet all over the seats. Well, where I come from, I'm a sort of a, a working class Geordie. And um, some of the values that you've sort of been brought up with was, you don't put your feet on the seats. So I remember saying to these two, two lads, uh, can you take your feet off the seats, lads? The third lad uh, with them was really quiet. Um, and I remember saying to him, why are you knocking around with these two guys? And he said, I don't have many friends. Um, I really haven't been able to really link up with anyone. Uh, anyway, we got talking as the train journey sort of started and he lived in a, a local village next to uh, where I live called Kidderminster. Um, and I said to him, I said, I know Kidderminster really well. Where do you live? And he went, I live in a place called St. Basil's. Um, my, you know, St. Basil's didn't really trigger anything for mm. me, like a lot of naivety from my perspective. I was like, what's St. Basil's? Where is that? Mm. And he said, it's a, it's a young homeless charity. So yeah, so I got really chatting uh, from there. I found out that he was doing a, a, a sports diploma at the local college mm -hmm. uh, in another nearby town. And I thought he's 16, 17 years old. He's doing a sports diploma. There's a good chance he's heard of a, the brand called Gymshark. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I remember saying to him, have you heard of a brand called Gymshark? He's like, oh my God, Gymshark is like the best brand. Uh, and I said, you fancy doing a week's work experience there? Yeah. Uh, I know a couple of people and he was like, Really, you could get me a week's work experience? I was like, I think so. So I give him my number. I remember him calling me on the Saturday and he said, uh, hey, Steve, he said, uh, just wanted to check in to see if that week's work experience is going to come to fruition. And I was like, yeah, yeah I've been managed to, to get your week's work experience. He said, phenomenal. Uh, he said, who do you know there? And I said, actually, you'll work there. Yeah. Um, anyway, we got chatting about what that week's work experience would look like. Before we ended the call, he said to me, so what do you do then? I said, I'm the CEO. And he couldn't believe the fact that we'd had this chance yeah, meeting. Yeah. So for me, it was like a, a sliding door moment. I'm sure it was for him as well. But um, we just found out actually in September, just gone, that he's now gone into university. And he, it was that sort of sliding door moment for him where he could have followed these two friends who probably were not going to end up on the right path versus actually an opportunity, that chance meeting where he went from that week work experience to some customer service with us and now he's gone on to university. And I'm not saying university is the, the be all and end all, but he's now on the right path. Yeah, it's an indicator, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, it was a case of, um, you know, how do you move on um, after seven years of probably one of the most incredible British brands there's been in recent years? Yeah. Um, and at that moment, I was like, that's my next move. That's, that's the vocation. So yeah. we now help create uh, brands North Stars, all, and really that's sharing the mistakes that we made at Gymshark, when I, certainly when I was CEO for seven years, um, imparting that knowledge onto them, um, and effectively a percentage of the fees or um, capital gain if we're investing into an organisation, then goes back to the two charities. Cool. And I think the, the fact that you've got that underlying purpose, it transcends building just a traditional consulting model. It gives you something extra that not only from an external perspective is attractive, but also makes it more motivating to do the work, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of consultants will, will 
have an approach with an organization. Um, and I find it's very theoretical based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the, th we, we got a lot right to Gymshock, but, but boy, see, oh, did I get a lot wrong. In fact, I got more wrong than I got yeah, right, yeah. certainly over that seven year tenure. Um, and I think it was a case of our positioning is, is we've actually breathed, lived and breathed some of the challenges that this, these SMEs have yeah, yeah. as they're going through their journey. So a sweet spot for us would be working with organizations from 10 to 100 million, but reality is the number's not important. It's about actually helping them achieve what they, what they set out to, to do in the first place. And I think that's where there's a lot of crossover, right? Like I think in terms of as commerce thinking and why there is so much sort of, I hate the word, but synergy between for now and commerce thinking is that concept of like our core motivation is really to help these leaders, founders of brands that have huge potential and are already doing really well, unlock that next stage. And I think there's a huge amount of gratification you get from relieving people of an insecurity around say technology and enabling them to make some decisions really clearly and then execute those decisions really effectively and just unblocking that next stage of growth and the kind of confidence that it breeds inside of an organization and the people in there it's something that i think we both share in that kind of like approach it is not transactional we're going in we're trying to really understand where they're at what their motivations are where they want to get to and then helping them achieve it right? And not just quick engagement and then off we go, see you. If you look at most organizations and the way that they're built, um, a lot of generally young founder CEOs end up overcomplicating the business that 100%. they originally created as a sort of a, as a brainchild. And I think where our fusion comes is, and this is the analogy I use with a lot of founders and a lot of CEOs, is, is effectively you're building a front end and you're building a back end. Mm -hmm. A lot of organizations are either very, 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 very good at understanding the tech and the operational side, mm -hmm. but they've got no, no idea how to disrupt the commercial side. Yeah. Um, I think with Commerce Thinking and for now, we've got a, a view of actually what foundation need to be built to actually effectively build the house in the right way. Mm -hmm. So before you stick a loft conversion in the house, you've got to make sure that those four foundations, um, which really generally uh, fall into four different areas, it's brand, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of great brands these days are community built. Um, again, there's not many organizations can build a real community. Then you've got the commercial side because the, mat the maths have to work. You can have all the, the brand purpose in the world, which uh, if you speak to many CFOs, they go, that's a bit of fluff. Mm. So the commercial side's got to work from a from a maths perspective. But then when they get the, the brand commercial bit right and they're on, on that fast growth trajectory, a lot of organizations then realize, I've got to make sure the back end catches up. Mm. And that's really dangerous. Yeah. And that's generally around, in this day and age, it's generally around tech. Uh, the, the, the greatest brands that are being built now are the ones who can can scale via tech solution without just uh, overloading with just people for people's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are the third and fourth areas? You said brand, commercial, third? Operational, so the, the, yeah. call it the tech stack, yeah. um, or the operational stack of which tech plays a massive, massive part in that. Uh, the fourth is the glue. So the way I'd, I would call the, uh, or, or summarize the glue would be people are the things that build great brands. Yeah. So you can't have a phenomenal disruptive brand where the maths work and the tech's great mm. if your culture is in a uh, in a bad place. Mm. Um, and again, a lot of SMEs that you see are generally um, built with a a view of the idea has to be driven by the most senior person in the room. Yeah. And actually, one of the things that certainly Ben at Gymshark I think really amplified was the best idea always has to win. So whether that comes from the CEO or whether it comes from a 19-year-old in your social media team, it's actually irrelevant. And actually some of the best ideas, certainly in my Gymshark tenure as CEO, did not come from me. Yeah. It came from that 19-year-old kid in the social media yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the fourth foundation is the people, which is the glue. And I think that's a recurring theme in a lot of the conversations that we have, is that concept of the culture of a business being so important. And I think it's really hard for a lot of founders and leaders to kind of put some meat around that. Like culture is inherently quite an abstract concept. Yep. 
and I know it'd be great to just expand upon like what you see as making a good culture. What are the practical things that somebody can do to start to engender the right behaviours and the right ways of working and the right attitudes that combine to create culture? It, the honest answer, it's a lot of things. And actually, culture is probably the most overused word in yeah. the business dictionary. I think, you know, I think people use that that word now as a bit of a buzzword. Um, for me, it's having the ability to create an environment. Mm. So the one thing that we strive for, the, the statement that we made at Gymshark uh, every single day was we wanted to create an environment where if you were looking at Gymshark from the outside, whether you're a fitness influencer, whether you're a, a potential new employee, it was like, I have to be part of that. Whatever they're doing, I have to be part of that. Mm. Um, now, to a degree, a lot of people can do that relatively well. Um, the trick is once you're in, mm. you create such an environment that they never, ever want to leave. Yeah. To summarize what we did really well, it wasn't just one thing. Yeah. It ultimately always has to start with your leadership team. If your leadership team can't live and breathe the values, and we did a lot of work on values, which tweaked actually from the, the first um, piece of work that we did on it. Uh, for example, you can't have caring in your values and then not offer private medical health care yeah, to your organization. Yeah. And the amount of organizations that I see now talk about, yeah, we really care for our staff, but actually, it's just words on a wall, right? It yeah. looks cool as you walk through the, the atrium or the reception of that brand. So you've got to be able to um, really more than articulate that you've got to reinforce those values. Yeah. And I think values also don't just resonate internally, they also resonate externally. Yeah. So when, for example, you're working with, when we, when we switched our three PL partners, with Blackman and Radial, yeah. Blackman over here in Europe and, and Radial, in, Radial in North America, the reason that they were selected wasn't because they were the cheapest option. Mm. The reason that we work with Radio and Blackman is that when we're in a room together and an external person walks in, mm. that person can't actually tell the differences to who works for Gymshark, Radio and Blackman. And that's why the value set is so important. So when we actually went out to do a, effectively a beauty parade with those three PLs, yeah, yeah. the reason why they won that project and won that long-term contract with us is that we believe they shared, shared the same values. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the, the superpower for us was when we got it wrong as leaders, yeah. we actually showed the, the vulnerability uh, trust with the, the, what was a thousand people in that organization to say, you know what, I got that wrong. Mm. And that was fine. It was okay to say as a leader, I have not behaved in the right way today and I apologize to you. Because mm. then people look at that and go, well, if he or she is willing to do that, then that's okay for me to do that too. Yeah. And I think a lot of leaders struggle with the word vulnerability. They like to show this armor that I don't get anything wrong. And, and sometimes saying sorry or admitting that we didn't quite get that decision right is absolutely fine. We see that so much. And, and I think the, like, the advantage of working with more and more brands and like, we're really selective, right? Like yeah. Tim and Tukum, we're really selective over who we work with and like what qualifies a brand that's relevant for us. A lot of it boils down to whether you call it vulnerability, insecurities, it's about being able to communicate those, right? And like we're looking for, for, for people and businesses that have got a ton of traction and they've got every reason to think that they are amazing. Yeah. But actually they're open about where they feel they're not amazing, where they've got insecurities. And it's usually those insecurities that we are really zeroing in on very early on. If a brand is guarded and not willing to talk about those things, they're probably not the right fit because you can give them the best advice all day, every day, but if they're not open to changing their mind, open to assessing where they're strong and where they're weak, you just don't have any chance of having positive impact, right? Certainly that's a, a big takeaway from the seven years of CEO Gymshark. And we didn't always get it right, by the way. Look, we, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, Gymshark the unicorn and Gymshark this, Gymshark that. And yeah, we had some wonderful years, but we probably got as wrong as, we, as much as we got right. I tell yeah. you so. Got you. So when you think about the, the next unicorn uh, brand, I think for me, the ingredients of the cake are lots of different things, lots of little things that really make that cake rise. Yeah. Brands who are building communities, and there's great examples certainly in the UK, but even probably better ones in the US right now, the ones who are really 
building authenticity with its community and looking at it long term. Yeah. Brands that are looking to outlast generations, those are the, those are the brands that will be, for me, the next unicorns, the, the next brands that get talked about for decades, not just a, a couple of years. Are there any standout names? There's a few. I think if you look at in the UK at the moment, you've got, you know, probably from a, a streetwear perspective or luxury streetwear perspective, I think represent are doing a great job. Um, I think the challenge for those guys now is how do they replicate that in the US market? Yeah. Um, so they, for me, would be, uh, would be standout. Uh, you've got AU Vodka in the alcohol space, based out of Swansea. Yeah. Um, two young guys, Charlie uh, Jackson, and there's another guy called Charlie Sloth involved as well. Uh, Mad as a fish, but he's a great, great lad. Um, again, going great uh, guns and disrupting the Grey Gooses and the Sorocs. Mm -hmm. You know, brands that are household, like global household names, and suddenly you're getting a young Swansea brand who have got you know, no limitations in terms of the way that they think are so super disruptive. Yeah. So they're building a, an alcohol brand, but they're building a community first. Right. And I think that's why they stand out. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I also think one of the, one of the big misconceptions out there in the market is that like to become a unicorn, you have to have this thing that is completely ethereal. It's just magic. Okay, yes, there is an element of timing. There probably is some elements of magic in creating that next big thing. But there are hundreds of brands out there already with the traction and the momentum that means that they are fit to go through that growth journey. There won't be many of those hundred, for example, just for, to pick a number, that will make that leap. And I think one of the biggest things that di differentiates those brands that break through from the ones that have the potential but never do is a, it's a huge amount of it is around discipline. Isn't it? A huge amount of it comes down to having a really, really clear plan, making really, really smart decisions, but also developing a culture whereby mistakes are, to a certain extent, encouraged. Like embraced, creating a, embraced. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the power of failure is an incredible thing. And that starts at the top and it permeates every part of the business. So I think one of the big things that I always try and call out is that the next unicorn is out there and is already demonstrating all of the characteristics that could make it amazing. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things that, maybe a bit too bold to phrase it like this, but like the unicorn is out there, they just need to get out of their own way. And, 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 and honestly, um, the amount of organization brands that will pick up the phone or send an email or send a DM on LinkedIn and go, can you help us become the next unicorn? My response is stop or stop thinking and getting obsessed with becoming a unicorn. Yeah. Build your brand with the right purpose. Make sure you've got the channels all working and maximize the opportunity and let the numbers work themselves out. Yeah. So I think people get obsessed with unicorn, 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 which is really effectively a, you know, a subjective valuation yeah. uh, much of the time. And I think those same leaders and same founders, if they're just focused in on um, creating their North Star and doing it really, really well. Yeah. They have got a much better chance of getting that spit out the end. Jim Shark, if you speak to Ben Francis, Jim Shark wasn't built because Ben is a 19 year old kid mm. working out of his, you know, his mum and dad's garage. He didn't think, I want to be a unicorn. Mm. He just wanted to build a purposeful brand that was going to outlast generations all around building this sort of conditioning community on a global yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. Unicorn was just a spit out of doing that really, really well. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about discipline, the amount of, again, brands that you see who are opportunistic and opportunistic works and has to work when maybe your cash flow's tight or the growth number's not quite right. But I'd love to see brands more disciplined against their North Star. Mm. Um, and, and when you create a North Star, I think brands have got to think about four fundamental things is, What's the purpose? So why do I why do I exist? Yeah. And it's interesting that because when you are able to articulate that really well, the conversations in the boardroom or even in any meeting actually become a lot more authentic. Mm. It's not about actually the most senior person in the room again winning their their way on a decision. It's actually what's right given uh, and driven around uh, what you know why we exist in the first place. So that's the first thing. That's like the the top of the triangle for me. The second element uh, is all around the audience. Mm. And that's who you exist for. So many organizations, you ask the question, who's your audience? They go, everyone globally. Mm. And my response to that is, I hope your marketing uh, dollar war chest is as big as, you know, 
the Nikes and the Apples of this world, because if they're not, you will fail. Mm. So being laser focused on an audience, again, which again, just really amplifies their authenticity based on that purpose and, mm. uh, and that demographic that they choose to go after. The third thing is the thing that we talked about earlier, which is value set. You can have the, the most ambitious purpose in the world and be laser focused on your audience. But if you've not got the right people in your organization or you're not right with, right, uh, working with the right partners who share those same values and you can, again, reinforce them on a daily basis, then what you've got is you've got a, um, uh, almost a organization that has no heart or soul. Mm, mm. And eventually you will fail. Mm. And the fourth thing is if you speak to a CFO, they go look at those th first three things. They're really nice, but they're a bit fluffy. Mm. The fourth bit is actually the model itself. So you talk about, you know, brands who are showing them in different channels, um, is the maths have to work. Mm. And I think when you get those four things right, you've just created something really special. And the amount of organizations that you go and meet their leadership team and you ask the question, what's your purpose and are you all aligned? They go, yeah, yeah absolutely, we're all aligned. Yeah. You get to the third person and they're already giving you a different answer to the first person. Uh, and the real, um, the real, the real next visionary brand for me, are, it will be the one who flies in formation really effectively, really efficiently. Yeah, I, I, and the the parallels between what you just described in terms of that overarching strategy and what unites the business as a whole. If you take our piece, which is tech strategy, really focusing in around operations. It's very, very similar. We, we find that we go into brands and we ask them, what is your current state? Tell me all about your operational processes from end to end. Talk me through how you um, handle orders. And just, just out of interest, how do they, even without being prompted, how did they answer that? Because you could take that question in lots of different ways. Yeah, so we structure it. So I think one of the things that we've worked ye for years on tailoring and refining is creating a really, really simple program that leaders, founders can follow to essentially surface the key things they're getting in their way from a tech and an operational perspective. And, and you put that into layman's terms or not? Oh yeah, 100%. Like the biggest thing is that we find is in the past, we probably thought of ourselves as a tech strategy business. Actually, we're not in the we are in the business of tech strategy. That is our core skill set. But ultimately, we're in the business of alleviating people's insecurities about technology and giving non-technical people a very, very clear, simple to understand way of becoming really good as a business in their tech and their operations. So it's stripping away, you know, like if you talk tech, you will be bombarded with acronyms. ERP, WMS, Being 3 blind with science. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. and it's into, like if you're not technical, and let's face it, like most of the the like new luxury brands that we work with, they are founded and led by people who are more inherently product and brand people. Yeah, Techno they're not they're creative, right? Exactly. It's not that like their the technology is not their core skill set, and as a result, they're making technology decisions, buying software in completely the wrong way without realizing it, and our core. I suppose value is giving them a model that means that they make decisions in a smart way, informed way, um, and, and ultimately they get better ROI on all of those different things that they have to invest in. And how do you articulate that in a brand? Because like, like us, you probably work with a lot of brands who are sort of still in that lifestyle yeah. organization. So I, you know, I always ask the question, do you want to become a lifestyle business or do you want to become a global brand? Yeah. And the answer to that question really defines the level of investment you're going to put into things like tech, into people, into the environment build itself, how you're going to show up, where you're going to show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So how do you tackle that crossroads? Because it's a, as you said, most founders, most CEOs, but founders in particular are super bright people, but they're super creative. Yeah. So when you get into the tech up stage or, or space, yeah. it's generally, not, I wouldn't say significant investment, but it's an area where they're not used to investing in. No. How do you, how do you, how do you tackle that? How do you articulate that where they feel that they, you know, you know, being honest, where they're not getting blinded by science? Yeah. Where they actually go, this is going to be game changing for my organization. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to, to, to have the broader conversation about where they feel they're at as a business and where they want to go. And I think one of the things that 
you in for now do really, really well and why I think this works as a partnership so well is that you are helping them to sort of crystallize and, and document a very, very clear vision of where they want to go to. Yeah. I think we, in some ways, lock and, in... And by the way, probably that's not over 10 years. That's will generally get people to think in it with a 36-month mindset. And we're the same. So we, 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 we think that people who sit down and say, let's create a tech roadmap for the next three years, it's so difficult and so unrealistic because the needs of the business change, um, the demands of the customer change, so you kind of have to be more flexible. We work on a 12 and then a, the furthest we go out is 24 months. So what we try and do is we say, okay, tell us about the business and we, we split it into two ways. So we'll say, what are your overarching ambitions? So big ambitions will be turnover always comes into it, although it isn't really the main driver of what needs to happen in the technology. What's more important is some of the things that they want to do, whether that be, do you want to internationalize? Yeah. Do you want to open up a warehouse and a distribution center in the US? Or so in integrating to 3PL providers? Yeah, exactly, or setting up their own warehouse. And then I suppose in addition to that, it's things like, what are the, some of the creative ideas that you've got? tech is currently a barrier to enabling you to do that, whether that be doing pre-sales really effectively, creating a ton of hype about specific product drops and how you actually manage that without destroying the business. So those are some of the more like forward looking, what are the things you want to do that you can't do currently that tech is going to enable? The and, other and, and what, you know, just picking yeah, up on a point there, it. one of the things that I see a lot is a lot of organizations, especially uh, D to C yeah. dominant uh, brands, they're not very good at forecasting. So is that a common theme that comes 100%. up? So we ask them to give us a, a breakdown. It's part of our like discovery process. We'll ask them to send us a certain set of, of resources, really common reports, things like that. Yeah. And then we ask them their confidence level in the accuracy. It's really simple, right? And Show that, us... Is that generally low? Do they think they're better than they think oh, they are? No. By and large, most of the businesses we talk to, and this I kind of think leads into the second element, which is this is where you, you're saying you want to get to or what you want to do that you can't do today. Yeah. The second element is what are the burning issues that keep coming up, recurring issues that you talk about at leadership level, you talk about with your operational teams, but no one's ever solving. And, and usually And they, do you find out that those things show up in the same way every time or do they tend oh, to differ? There's a lot of commonality. There's more things that businesses share in common that differentiate them, particularly given our real, real zeroing in focus on this new luxury category. Like we, we literally qualify ourselves into an opportunity based on do they meet and, and, and fit into this kind of like the characteristics that new luxury brands share. So vast majority of businesses will say, I don't trust our stock figure. I don't trust the numbers that we're reporting on in like weekly trade meetings. And it takes us far too long to do things like a management accounts on a monthly basis. These are inherently quite unsexy things. But if you do not get them right, you ain't going to do any well, of the sexy stuff. Well, you say unsexy things. Most people think the business end of a business is in the front end, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the product, the creative, the bringing the brand to life. Yeah. And that's half true. In a stock-based business, yeah. the real business end is actually where your, and how your stock shows up and how you forecast against that. Exactly. Uh, and how, you know, how nimble you are in turning that stock. So, um, interesting enough, the amount of founders who don't quite understand that straight away, but actually after a little bit of time, they really get it. Yeah. Um, and I will say to people, uh, or certainly founders, outside of the people conversation, your biggest asset is your stock, but it's also your biggest liability too. 100%. So I think if, if organizations can fix or improve that, um, or improve the tech, or integrate tech to improve the, uh, the business end of that business, yeah. then it's only going to add up with success, right? And you know, it's a question back to you. It's like one of the characteristics that we see that we think that's what good looks like. There is the openness to being challenged, but it's the second element, which is then committing and ensuring that there is alignment ongoing. And that means constant brokering of prioritization, maybe giving people the answer that they don't want to hear to ensure that you're protecting the decision that was made. Yeah, yeah. How did you like 
how do you today sort of manage that and try and instill that into businesses? It's one thing committing to a direction and a decision in the room on that day. It's a very different thing when you're getting pressures a month or two months later to try and divert the focus somewhere else. How do you ensure that those decisions stay set and that people actually commit and execute what you've agreed? Yeah, no, great question. I think this is the difference between now a lifestyle business mm. and a leader or a leadership team. Generally, it's not one person, it's a leadership team coming together to think like a global brand. Mm. And generally what happens in a lifestyle-driven environment is that they end up becoming a butterfly in a leaf. Yeah. So they become opportunistic. So what they said two weeks ago isn't now current two weeks later. Mm. And suddenly, actually, the, the communication that they've just got to the wider business, or even among themselves, mm. within a month has completely changed. Mm. Now you've got a rudderless organization. And actually, that's when people start to leave, is when they actually don't believe in that, in that purpose. We, as I said, we've defined it as North Star. Mm. And a North Star isn't built for an organization for, um, or defaulting to yes or opportunity, it's actually the other way around. It's, a, it's actually about defaulting to no mm. and staying disciplined. So back to your point in terms of sticking to and staying disciplined about um, agreeing and, and articulating and reinforcing something that you said two weeks ago yeah. is uh, making sure that your view of the three year, for us it's 36 months, because a lot can happen, look at, look at COVID. Mm. You know, that the change in the world in 36 months is ridiculous. Now, I'm not saying we're gonna have another COVID event, hopefully, hopefully not. But it, it, um, it's one of those examples where there's factors outside of your control that can correct. profoundly influence 100%, but if the you think about COVID, COVID accelerated 2030 to 2020. Yeah. And I think the brands who are able to work almost in, and I'm gonna use a tech term here, sort of a sprint, 36 month, three year sprints will actually keep them, you know, super authentic, mm. super agile, super disruptive, but actually not going away from uh, what their overall purpose is. Mm. And again, that goes back to the, the next visionary brand mm. are the ones who are able to do that really, really well. Yeah. And again, founders, just because they're entrepreneurial in terms of spirit and opportunistic. Yeah, yeah. You know, some of the great ingredients that you need as a, as, a, as a real entrepreneur actually work against you as you get to 30, 40 million, wanting to strive to get to 200 million. Yeah. And, and I see a lot of it where even with people, people will say to me, or leaders, founders will say to me, right, I've got the business to 30, 40 million pounds, we're going great guns, but I've got some questions on my current senior team. Mm. Are they good enough? Are they not good enough? Mm. Do they have the right skill set to take us to 100? Well, is that all saying the people who get you to 30 million may not be the same people who get you to 100. But yeah. people think, well, that's then really um, binary. It's like, okay, well, those people have to leave my organization and I have to part with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely not the case. They, they can actually be part of the journey, mm. but they may not be in the lead seat in that particular function. Yeah. But going back to your question in terms of answering probably that, in, in, um, with real depth is the organization who are disciplined, mm. who actually say no to the opportunity that then diverts them from what they talked about even two weeks ago. Yeah, or the two one, minutes ago. Two minutes ago yeah. in some cases, are the ones who actually really stand out because they're the brands who stay authentic to their audience. And you've got to be laser focused on that audience for a long, long time. That's, those are the brands who, who outlast, outlast generations. Yeah. And if you think of all the best brand examples that are relevant of which sector, globally, those are the ones who are actually did some Nike. Um, you know, I watched the Air movie yeah, it's class, the other day, it? and that was about, you know, Phil Knight being, you know, absolutely set on where this brand was going to end up. And certainly within that arena, it's, you know, it's the brand that gets talked about most. Yeah, and, and that theme, I think, is a really interesting one that we should dig into. The idea of like the discipline that's required at the most senior level and how you ensure and engender that. It can be very difficult in founder-led brands, right? Because most founders, I mean, we are founders in our own businesses, but most founders in like a fashion brand tend to be very, very creative, very, very drawn to new, very, very interested in newness. And that can be a real challenge to navigate. Now, you must have had that in the early days when you moved into Gymshark, right? Yep. How did you navigate that? Like, is, is, is Ben unique in his characteristics and open to having somebody else come in and in many ways take a lot of those decisions off his plate? Yep. 
like talk us through how you kind of brokered this the setting and then how that is like influencing how you're working with brands today yeah certainly wasn't overnight i think ben is um certainly different in many cases because his ability at his age to listen yeah was phenomenal right would i have listened in the same way 19 20 years old absolutely not i would have been probably a little bit more arrogant at his age mm. than than he was and i think people say to me what was the what was the defining moment of of jim shark's growth and i've said this many times internally and externally was actually through failure it was through black friday 2015 where we had back to tech stack actually yeah, we had a we had on paper a great plan a uh, but really no plan b uh, and I remember ben coming to me afterwards saying i don't want to build the businesses in this way. We've just let down 35% um, of our customer base overnight. 35, that would put most businesses out of business overnight. Yeah, yeah. And I remember him coming to me saying, I don't want to do it like this anymore. And I asked him one question, it's back to, do you want to become a lifestyle business or do you want to become a global brand? Mm -hmm. Because the answer to that will, will make the difference of what you're going to bring in operationally, mm -hmm. whether it's from a tech perspective, um, the glue, yeah. what, what level of people, what experience, and by the way, as I said, it doesn't always have to be uh, the, the best CV, it's about the right CV, and I wanna come back to that point in a second. Mm -hmm. um, my job was actually relatively simple. Okay. Um, ben and the, and the team had, had stumbled uh, and were pioneers in uh, something called influencer marketing, mm -hmm. uh, certainly within the fitness space. It did not exist back in 2012, 2013. They'd, they started to build a community without some of the, even the bigger brands even thinking about community. I remember Gymshark showing up on TikTok, a million followers before even Nike were on the platform. Mm -hmm. So these guys were ahead of their time in the way that they thought. And I think the thing that really helped them is that they were the community, they were the demographic. They wanted something different in that space. Yeah, and I think this is like when we talk about like, who's going to be watching this i think this this dynamic at the leadership level between founders and then senior leadership that enter the building i think this will be a something that they can really recognize themselves in that dynamic between moving from founder-led business that then wants to grow and become bigger and and scale out it's how you actually navigate that change and how you, you you sort of broker those decisions well i'll tell, I'll tell you the thing that stops those leadership teams doing yeah. that is ego right so one of the red flags that we have when we're working now with brands is we don't care whether you're the most successful um financially solid organization in the world if there is ego in that leadership team mm. it's a red flag for us mm. because e ego generally equals arsehole <laughs> and egos generally don't want to listen so you talked about it earlier yeah, yeah. um we get asked um can you come in and help and you you answer the question mm. Uh, and they don't like the answer. Yeah. And my view is, is don't ask the question in the first place if you don't like the honest answer. Mm. So what we find is the, the organizations who are like really great are the ones who um, have no ego in that leadership team. Yeah. Because what happens if it's in that team, that filters all the way through your organization. And we say, you know, it's not to say humans don't have egos. We've all got an, an element and a level of ego, but I think, when you come into that environment, you've got to leave it at the door on a Monday morning, you can sort of pick it back up on a Friday evening. Mm. That was our view. Nice. So um, I think for me, that's a blocker when you look at how leadership teams work together uh, and back to whatever that purpose is, whatever that ride that they're on, um, the thing that really gets in the way is ego because now you're into the best, ideas, best idea is not winning. Mm. The idea that's winning is the person who's most senior in the room. Mm. And I remember me and Ben having a conversation is, we can never use our titles when we go into a meeting. Mm. Um, we have to set the discipline of being on time for a meeting because if, we, if we're if we not able to do that, guess what everybody else does? It's so true. Like and, and I talked about it earlier, but the biggest thing that you can do as a leader is show vulnerability. So when you get it wrong, you say, hold on, we got a decision wrong. Who am I finding out? Whose fault is it? It's no, no, that decision and that error sits with me. And all we're going to do is we're going to learn from that. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And I think when I like relate that sort of message back to our work, I think where we've worked 
best and where we've had the most difficulty actually having positive impact in brands is that presence of whether you call it ego or protectiveness. Like if we're introduced into a brand and we're doing a technology audit, it's fairly, it's fairly understandable that somebody who's employed by that business in a tech position may feel a little bit defensive about these app, this external party coming in. The best brands are where there's a real openness. Absolutely. There's this sense of actually, there's some real great experience. We don't, know, we don't know what we don't know. Exactly. And like, let's be open to that. And I think like, you're looking for people with sponges between their ears rather than rocks between their ears, right? Like you want people to be open-minded and just trying to sort of soak all of the inputs um, up. Um, and actually, yeah, it's such a clear message. Get the egos out of the room and you will have far, far more productive, whether it's leadership team meetings, whether it's operational team meetings. Yeah, no. And for me, back to the regionalization, uh, element, the amount of, again, leaders, CEOs that you meet who go, yeah, desperate to go to the US. Mm. Certainly UK brands, we've got the obsession of making it big in the US and the US is a very tough market. Mm. First question I always ask is, have you exhausted your scale here first? Yeah. Because actually, if you look at certainly UK, UK domicile brands, there's a huge opportunity here. And most of those brands who have got these international ambitions, yes, of course you want, you, you, of course you want to build a global household name eventually, but I think you also have to do that in steps and that, that talks them back to structure, mm. where you don't think, right, I've got to now go after 10 geos, I've got to employ a bunch of Americans, Australians, German team, French, and suddenly now you've got, you're bloated as an organization. Yeah. Um, and I think we had this little bit of obsession. Uh, I had this obsession of Gymshark where it was about, we need to bring in effectively geo custodians in every single one of those regions. And actually, if we'd have just sort of really kept it to a core number of geos without, without this sort of obsession and uh, addiction of uh, exploding all the geos at the same time, I think we would have been a much more effective organization than, than we were. And we were still pretty good, yeah. uh, but we could have been even so much better. So I think back to structure, I think regionalization is really important part to think about, but just layering in people into your business isn't always the right answer. And for me, it, I'd keep your leadership team super simple, mm. right C versus best CV, mm. flat as long as you can, and, and over communicate with people internally, more so than you, even externally as a brand. Nice. Luke, you smashed it there, mate. Well, well done. Good man. Well done. Thanks for setting all this up as well, guys.